We have, we have another case to go through. I have a case to go through. You have a case. I have a case for you. You're going to start with the case, but then yeah. I'm going to ask you questions. And yeah. I'm not going to answer no, any of them. No. Haney wanted me to put you in the hot seat this time. Yeah. All right. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> this could be a disaster. All right. So we're going to talk about a, a few out of hospital cardiac arrests. All right. So bread and butter, emergency medicine. You got this. I think All you right. can do this, Swami. I have taken care of a cardiac arrest before. One or two. All right. Here we go. I'm going to give you a, a little story okay. time. So there's a 55-year-old guy. He's watching his son play baseball at a nearby park. Um, the park is maybe 20 minutes from the hospital, and he suddenly collapses. A bunch of parents are on the sideline. They rush in. Somebody checks a pulse. They don't feel a pulse. They start immediate compressions, activate EMS. The fire station is, I don't know, maybe like a two-minute drive away from the park. It is like the best scenario for an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. They get there immediately, get the AED on, they see it's a shockable rhythm, they defibrillate, scoop him up, throw in the back of the ambulance, and now he is arriving at your hospital. He's okay. gotten two shocks, okay. he's gotten some epi, and they've got ROSC. All right. All right. So, so now- the first, first thing I know is this did not happen in New York City. Oh, okay. There's no bystander CPR in New York City. <laughs> Okay, so just leave him. Yikes. Okay, so this is not New York, great. One now point for Philly. Now he's in front of me. All right, now I have to do something. Now you have to do something. Okay. okay. Right. And so the cath lab is a great destination. Yes. Would you like to send this patient to the cath lab? This 55-year-old so, man. Question. Yeah. So 55. And there was a time where we would say, that's probably enough to say it's probably cardiac and you should probably get a cath. There, there was a time, there was like a window where they just all went to the cath lab and we never saw them. I missed but that window. I know. <laughs> But I guess what I want then is an EKG. So okay. let me see an ECG okay. so then I can decide whether I'm going to the cath lab. Okay. Here's your EKG. I'm going to the cath lab. Okay. Not Immediate. <laughs> the patient is Immediate, definitely... yes. Yeah, so this is a Why? Step. Okay. This patient has an acute coronary occlusion, obstruction, myocardial infarction, whatever you want to call it. Good. Qualifies with continuous leads, ST elevations, reciprocal changes, Probably has some posterior component to the inferior component. So I would like to call cardiology. I would like the patient to go away because I have other things. Yes. The, the cath lab is an amazing place for a disposition. Yes. The cath lab. There's an inferior STEMI here. Okay. Wait, but I do have a question. We yes. didn't talk about it. So you said ROSC. You did not tell me if the patient's awake. The patient is not awake. Okay. So does that change my decision? Because I would probably still call cardiology. But Absolutely. would it change their decision? It's really, like my decision doesn't change. I see cardiac arrest. I see occlusion myocardial infarction. I call the cath lab. Yeah. But are they going to say to me, there's no neurologic function. We're not going to cath it. It's a little hard to tell. The patient got intubated on the way in. And so at this point, I don't know. I, okay. I, it, you don't have a great neuro exam right now, but you have, this right. is his immediate EKG. Right. So I, I'm definitely going to act. Okay. I think that's fine. I guess my question really is, would it change what they, would they defer catheterization? Does the neurologic function matter? I think in a guy, in somebody with a great story, okay, somebody with a great story, a shockable rhythm, and this EKG, I think you're probably going to go full court press on this one. Okay. However, I'm going to tell you that this guy got defibrillated, I told you, in the field, and he also got some epinephrine in oh, the that's field. Right. Okay, so I, I know the answer to this one. So my cardiologist might say, when was the ep? And they might say, uh, the ST segment changes you're seeing are because they got epinephrine and they got shunt. And so they might ask me, can you get another ECG? Not your first rodeo, I see. Not my first yeah, rodeo. Yeah, not your I first rodeo. Okay, yes. I, I remember saying to them, what? just take the patient. It's a STEMI, just go. But there's a reason. So Correct. There's a reason they want yes. to know about that. Yeah, so CPR is traumatic to the myocardium, as is defibrillation, as is epinephrine. And so all of these things can certainly cause ST elevation. So this is just an injury pattern. How do we know that this injury pattern is unique to a culprit vessel that requires okay. a stent? All right. So that makes sense. It's like when we look at those SBT ECGs and we see ischemic yeah. changes and you're like, but I'm not tapping people with SBT, even though they clearly had ST changes, right? We get the post-conversion ECG and make that decision. So how, when do I get the next ECG? I'm so glad you asked. Five minutes, 10 minutes? Yeah. So let's talk about this. Eight minutes. Eight, eight minutes exactly. Eight minutes exactly. Now, if it's eight minutes and 30 seconds, you waited too long and you're going to get criticized. And if it's seven minutes and 48 seconds, they're going to say, 
wait 12, wait 12 seconds. seconds. <laughs> I would hope right. not. But, but average eight minutes. But average about eight minutes. And so that's to allow for that epinephrine and that trauma from the CPR to wash out, right? And all the injury pattern that you might see from the defibrillation process, all that stuff to wash away. And then hopefully you are left with truly what is going on in the myocardium and is it ischemic or not. So get that initial EKG. We all want it. Wait eight minutes. Okay. Repeat the EKG, okay. which feels like a really long time when you have a patient that you really want to get rid of. But repeat the EKG. And if you still see ST elevation in a pattern that looks like it might be part of a culprit vessel, then that patient well, needs to go to the cath Let me lab. ask you practically how you're doing this. Yeah. You get that first ECG. It shows that STEMI pattern that we looked at. Are you calling cards at that time or, or are you activating the cath lab at that time? but knowing they're going to ask for another ECG, right. were you waiting for the second ECG to act? So that's a great question. I work at an academic center, as do you. We have fellows in-house, so I can certainly give the fellow a heads up and say, hey, I have an out-of-heart hospital cardiac arrest. I've got ROSC. I've got ST elevation on an EKG. Come down now. I'm about to do an echo. We may need to activate. I'm going to repeat the EKG. Okay. And so that's how I would play out that scenario. If it's 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm at a moonlighting gig. My interventionalist is home asleep. I'm probably going to wait. I'm going to wait for the repeat, wait. repeat and then call. Now, let me say, let's say that you wait, repeat, and it improves. Are you not calling them? Great question. I'm going to come back to that. Okay, let's come right, back. Hold to that. that thought. Okay, yes. all right, because okay. I think that's a really important thing. Yeah. And the other one I want to come back to, I want to make sure we come back to, is let's say that I'm working at that outlying hospital. And the second ECG shows a STEMI pattern, and I'm going to transfer. Yeah. If I can't get a transfer done expeditiously, am I giving lytics? Ooh, case? good question. So I and, think we should come back. And to I've both had that scenario too. Because these are real things that happen to everybody in this yep, room. Totally. All right. In this particular case, we repeated the ECG. Yes. What does the repeat look like? The ST elevations are still exactly okay, so the same. They're going to the lab. Okay. Done. They're Fine. done. Does the presenting rhythm make any difference? So if this patient had a non shockable rhythm, but came back, versus they had a shockable rhythm and came back. Okay. Does that change what I do or it doesn't make any difference? So let's say your patient comes in and the an EMS tells you that it was, it's a PEA arrest from the field and they're coming in now and now they have ROSC. They did all their interventions. They have ROSC. The patient is now in your emergency department. Okay. And you don't have ST elevation on your EKG. This is your EKG. So this one, I see some changes that could be ischemic, but I'm probably not going to activate based on this. Okay. Why? Because I don't see a clear ST elevation or an OMI pattern. Good. I don't see something that's, they're clearly going to have something. And so the data, remember, tells us, you're going to tell us exactly, but all right, there we go. There so we Tomahawk, go. Study, Tomahawk course, study, yes. Says these patients are less likely to have something I can intervene on. You not are exactly can, right. Yes. But a, but a cardiologist. So Tomahawk. This was patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. They get ROSC. It was a mixed bag. It was shockable rhythm, non-shockable. It was all comers of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. They come into the emergency department, and they basically said, you don't have an ST elevation on your EKG. We're going to randomize you to either immediate angiography or delayed angiography. Okay. okay? And so what are the outcomes? Do the patients who get immediate angiography do better because we want them to do better, right? You just had a cardiac arrest. I want you to go to the cath lab and hopefully you'll get an intervention and hopefully your outcomes will be better. Sadly, no. So that did not pan out. So actually mortality at 30 days, 54% for the immediate angiography mm -hmm. group versus 46% for the delayed angiography group. So the patients that went for immediate angiography had higher mortality at 30 days than the patients that had delayed angiography. And I know there's been a lot of hypothesizing yes. of why. Yes. Maybe it's because we didn't take the time to resuscitate the patient. The cath lab is not a good destination for resuscitation. They only do one thing. That's not really, I'm oversimplifying the cardiologist's job. I understand that. They only do one thing. All they are going to do there is cap the patient. They're going to do That's a left it. heart cap, yeah. but they might miss the PE or whatever else. The head bleed, whatever so else caused their out of hospital cardiac arrest. now we're arrest. delaying finding that. Yep. Because they're not getting any evaluation aside from the cat. Exactly. Okay. Yes. So if they do not have a STEMI pattern, yes. I am not sending them up. That's correct. Because of Tomahawk. Correct. Does it make a difference if the patient had a V-fib arrest? Because there was a time where we said, oh, it's V-fib. Clearly, they're going to have cardiac 
occlusion, a, a coronary occlusion. Yeah. And they should definitely go. So if they had a V-fib arrest, but do not have a STEMI pep. So I here's have... your V-fib arrest. Right. This is now, your 55-year-old guy right. with hypertension mm. and hyperlipidemia and diabetes. And you said he's a man, too. And it's a man. So it's probably coronary. Yes. And he had a V-fib arrest. That's what arrest. we used to assume. Yeah. We would say, right? And he came in, but now this is his EKG. I think there was a time we would activate and say it was a V-fib arrest. So even though the EKG doesn't show it, we still think the patient should go to the cath lab. Yeah. And there was a time where it kept, the cath lab was taking all of them. Yeah. And then they were like, no, we're not going to take them anymore. Yeah, yeah. This is so, ludicrous. We have a lot of negative caths. Yeah. So that's COACT, the oh. COACT trial. So about 500 patients, similar story. So this is now a V-fib arrest. So a shockable arrest in the field. We get ROSC. They come to the emergency department, and now we randomize them. Immediate angiography versus delayed angiography. Immediate, like within two hours, delayed 24 hours okay. or more later. Okay. okay. No STEMI on the ECG, though. But these are shockable rhythms that they came in with. What do you think happened? You're going to tell me that they didn't do better, which <laughs> sucks because I really want... Cat Lab is great. Cat then the patient's great. out of my emergency yeah, department. Yeah. Right? They're gone. Yeah. Everybody's happy. Yes. Except but for the no, patient. Except apparently. for the patient who <laughs> apparently does not benefit from the immediate angiography. But they get a bigger bill. Or the interventionalist who came in at three o'clock in the morning to, to do this cath. So yeah, 65% versus 67% survival at 90 days. Not great. Not great. It is great, but not better. So what we do know is no, we do not need to activate the cath lab for these out-of-hospital cardiac arrests with ROSC if there is no ST elevation on that ECG that you got eight minutes okay. after okay. <laughs> they arrived, right? There's like always, there's always nuance, right? Yeah. Your clinical expertise comes in also. Yes. So let's say that I have a V-fib arrest, ROSC, no neurologic function. The ECG does not show a STEMI pattern, but there's something else that makes me think, or what else would push you to say, I understand all those things. I'm still going to get cardiology. Yeah. So that's where you're thinking about all the other things. So I want to make sure I've ruled out the other things. Is there something in the story that makes me think this is PE? Is there something in the story or history from family or bystanders that makes me think this was a vascular catastrophe in their brain? If I'm not getting any of that stuff and I've done my workup, I'm calling cards. Okay. Okay. I'm not activating. Because remember, activating is you're bringing in the interventionalist. You're bringing in a nurse. You're bringing in a tech. You're bringing in an entire team that still has to come back at 8 o'clock in the morning and do all the regular cases that are scheduled. And so this is where I'm picking up the phone and, yeah, I'm going to inconvenience my interventionalist and have a conversation and say, I've got a guy with a really great story who had a V-fib arrest, who does not have ST elevation on their EKG, but I have no other reason for why this person went into this cardiac arrest other than ischemia. And if they tell me it's 3 a.m. and I'll cath him I'll at cath 7, yeah. great. And at least it's on their radar. And at least I know they're coming in and this patient has a destination. Okay. That makes sense. I'm going to change it. I'm going to make it a little more challenging. Okay. Before we get back to thrombolytics. Sure. Out of hospital cardiac arrest, V-fib, shocked, comes out of it, is awake. ECG does not show a stent. Yeah. But the patient says, I have chest pain. It's going to my left arm. Now should I act? The patient, I, I've done this before. Yeah. And the cardiologist, did they get compressions? Because <laughs> believe it or not, compressions cause chest pain. But if the patient has a good, is awake and has a good ischemic story. Yeah. But the ECG doesn't show. It, yeah. Should I be calling? I call. You call. I do but call. But you're not activating. But, but I'm not calling. activating. Okay. But I'm calling. Fair. We are very strict with activation. Okay. So I want to be very clear about what gets activated and what deserves a phone call. That patient deserves a phone call. Okay. Fair and, enough. and let the interventionalist defer if they want. And then they can activate if they want. They can, yeah. They can say, you know what? I think we should take this let's person activate. right now. Let's activate. Absolutely. Okay. Fine. I, I'm, I, all of that makes sense. Yeah. Let's go back to the thrombolytic question. Yeah. So I'm working at that remote hospital. It's a three-hour transfer to cath lab. And I have this patient. Should I give thrombolytic in that case? Yeah, that, those are so tricky. And so I think that's where you have to do your due diligence. So there's STEMI on the EKG. This is the one with STEMI on the EKG. Yeah. You have no other reason for those. S this is not like a pericarditis or something else that's causing those ST elevations. And the story was good preceding. Yeah. So there's I mean, really I no difference that in yeah. that kind of situation. If you work at one of those places and a STEMI walks in, you're going to give thrombolysis. Correct. Because you can't get them to cath in time. Yes. Correct. So this, nothing changes here. It's not necessarily that it's just cath that's better for them. It's any revascularization. Correct. So if I have lytics, I'm giving lytics. If they have ST elevation on that ECG post-arrest. No. 
No. Yeah, they deserve the benefit of the pharmacology, if not the intervention. Okay, let's bring it all together. So let's bring it all together. Get that initial ECG post-arrest. Okay, if you see ST elevation, repeat it in eight minutes. You should be repeating all the EKGs anyway but especially if you see ST elevation. We want to make sure that those are legitimate before you bring in an entire team in the middle of the night, potentially, for this case. If it's a STEMI and it's a legitimate STEMI on that repeat EKG, that patient's going to the cath lab. Super easy. They are going to benefit from early intervention. No STEMI, we know there is no benefit to immediate cath. Okay, so you cannot really activate in that scenario, but if there's a good story and your suspicion is high, you're going to have a conversation with your interventionalist. Now, there are some caveats to this. If the patient keeps going in and out of an unstable rhythm, they have recurrent V-fib, they have recurrent V-tac, that's an unstable dysrhythmic patient. That patient probably deserves the cath lab too. They are having ongoing ischemia, putting them into this. The patient is in cardiogenic shock post-arrest. Again, another good reason for them to get revascularized. So another conversation, you're picking up the phone, you're calling for help. And then PE, really big PEs that are going to cause a cardiac arrest and you get that CT and you're like, oh, wow, this was not ischemia, but this is a PE. Do you guys have a PE response team? We do. And I yeah. know the recent recommendations are to call the cath team, but I think a lot of that is predicated on what your cath team does. Correct. So if you work at a place where your cath team does the catheters, and they do catheter-directed lytics, that might be your interventional cardiologist. Correct. If you work at a place where IR does that, it might be IR. Honestly, for me, this is a place where I don't think if it's a massive pulmonary embolism, I think it's systemic lytics. Yeah. And then you call. Them. Yeah. But I don't think the patient should be going to the cath lab. That's my take. Yeah. And I think the AHA is overstepping a little bit to get their cardiologist a little bit more work. I think that the patient, and, and honestly, most of the time when I call my interventionist yeah. and they're like, that sounds like a massive PE. Why don't you give them some systemic lytics? Call us back in a couple of hours. We might take them for delayed intervention. Yeah. And our PERT team is very aggressive. And so... During business hours, I would say they want these patients up in the cath lab, and it is our interventionalists that are doing these cases. So they want to whisk them up, and they want to pull that clot out or do the catheter-directed lysis. So it's just going to be dependent on your institution and what you have available. The gray zone. So these are the couple of cases, the, the cases where you get that ECG, you wait your eight minutes, and it's not a STEMI, but it's a concerning ECG, right? You see those shark fins, De Winters, Wellens. You see something that makes you think this is an occlusive myocardial infarction on that ECG. Again, that deserves a phone call. That is a very concerning feature. And that person probably should be getting immediate angiography. And then you brought up the story, right? The patient come, is awake and they're telling you, before I arrested, I had chest pain. I had shortness of breath. I had palpitations. And then they dropped and had their cardiac arrest. A good story also deserves immediate angiography. Okay. I like it. I think that wraps all of it up. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, right. guys.